ultrasonic patient uses ultrasonic waves to break open cells and shear or rip apart DNA. And we use it when we're doing a cell lysis. And here's how it works. Ultrasonication works by using sound waves that are too high for us to hear, so they're ultrasonication, although you still hear some noises. These waves create these areas of high and low pressure, and in the low pressure areas, it's easier for bubbles to form, so you get bubbles forming in the liquid. But then as the, after those bubbles form, they're hit by an area of high pressure. In the high pressure area, it's harder for those bubbles to survive, and so they collapse. They collapse in a process called gaseous cavitation. And what happens is basically they're going to release shock waves as they do this. And these shock waves are then going to travel through the liquid, um, hit those cells that you're trying to break open. They're going to help you break open those cells and they're also going to help you shear apart um, the DNA. So basically break the DNA up into little pieces, which can be very helpful because that DNA can be really, really gloopy. Um, there's a lot of DNA inside of cells, and when you break open the cells, that DNA is going to want to spread out and stuff, um, take up a lot of space, maybe pull your protein with it. And so by shearing it, by breaking it up into smaller pieces, you can therefore help like degloop your mixture. Um, then you typically, the next step would be to spin it down to separate out um, the precipitated DNA and the membrane bits and stuff from the soluble things, which is um, often what your pro the protein that you're interested in is in. So let's talk in a little more detail about how it works. To understand how what, what's going on, we need to understand a little bit the difference between a solid, a liquid, and a gas. The basic difference is how much energy that these molecules have. In a liquid, in a solid, the molecules are going to be kind of stuck to one another. In a liquid, the molecules can slide past one another, and in a gas, the molecules are totally independent from one another, and they can move around freely. What dictates this, which state it's in, is going to depend on things like how sticky they are for one another, so like the molecules are for one another. So for example, water, it's really sticky. It's what we call polar. It has these partial positive regions and this partial negative region, which I go into lots more in another post. But this makes it so that water molecules are going to want to stick to one another, and therefore it's going to take more energy in order for them to overcome their interactions with another molecule. So if you have a low temperature, what this means is that the molecules don't have very much energy. And so they can't, they don't have enough energy to break free from the bonds from one another. If you give them more energy, well, now they can start to break away from those bonds and even more energy and they can um, break free. Now, what happens though, is that the amount of energy they actually need in order to make it as a gas um, to actually escape permanently rather than just like escape temporarily and then get caught by another molecule they need to the pressure needs to be low enough so the higher the pressure is basically the harder it is going to be for those molecules to get away once they've entered that gas state and so if you are in a high pressure zone it's going to take more energy in order to break free. So when we talk about more energy, we're talking typically about a higher temperature. So if you raise the temperature, it makes it easier for these molecules to escape as a gas. But you can still get these molecules to escape as a gas, or what we call vaporize, below the boiling point. So the boiling point would be the temperature at which half of the molecules have um, the ability, enough energy to break free. Below the boiling point, basically, you can still break free, but you typically have to be at a surface. And this is because at the surface, the pressure is going to be lower. And if the pressure is going to be lower, it's going to be easier for you, for you to break free. There's fewer molecules kind of trying to hold you back and you can break free from, from the liquid surrounding you. When molecules do this together, they can kind of team up and they form these bubbles. And then um, bubbles can then, um, if they were into contact with the air, 
they can go and join like the bulk air or they can form these bubbles that basically the bubbles are going to the gas molecules in the bubble are going to push on the surroundings try to break free but if the pressure in the surroundings is too high well now those bubbles are going to burst and what's going to happen in the case of the sonication is that the pressure is going to initially this pressure is lower um, and so these bubbles can form and thanks to Boyle's law, we know that when a pressure, when a, um, the lower the pressure is, the higher the volume is. So those gas molecules are going to start to spread out within the low pressure zone. So you have these growing gas bubbles, but then before they can grow too big, you bam, you're hit by a high pressure region. And in this high pressure region, now the external pressure is going to be too high. Those gas molecules can't push out enough and they're going to collapse. And when they collapse, the energy that they had is going to be converted into like these shock waves that are then going to travel through the liquid and um, break up your molecules. In terms of how it actually works in practice, there are a few different forms of sonicators. So there's like bath sonicators, which basically looks like a bath. There are probe sonicators where you have this metal probe that then goes sticks into the liquid. Um, and this stick, um, they, there's like the bigger probes, they're also, and there's like micro probes, which are tinier, and you can stick into your liquid. Note that in both cases, we're talking about these waves traveling through a liquid. When we talk about sound waves, these waves require some sort of medium in order to move. So they can't just like move through a vacuum or something. They actually move through something, some sort of matter, and they're pushing aside the molecules as they go. So it's not like light where it can just travel through things um, without kind of harming those things because it's just like energy moving. In the case of this, the sound waves or and the ultrasonic waves are a type of sound waves are just ultrasonic, so higher than or a higher frequency than we can hear. Um, basically, they're going to push aside the, the stuff that they're moving through as they go. And this is how you get those high and low pressure areas. And we can get those waves that are going to push things either from the sides of like the bath sonicator or emanating out from the probe. Now, when we do this, we're not trying to raise the temperature. We're just trying to like, but we need to give those molecules some energy. And when you give molecules energy, you, you're raising the temperature. And so when you raise the temperature, that can damage your molecules. And so in order to protect your molecules, if you're using one of those um, probe sonicators, what we often do is you stick your sample on ice, um, make a nice little ice bath. It's helpful to kind of take a styrofoam container and cut out holes in the top. And now you can stick your beaker in the hole in, a, in an ice bucket. Um, and so basically you want to kind of make an ice, an ice water slushy mostly ice but still some water so that what's going to happen is that as your solution heats up it's not going to just like fall down into the ice as the ice collapses you want those bubbles to collapse but not your ice to collapse and your um, liquid to fall down you also want to orient the probe so that it's just um maybe like a couple of centimeters above the bottom of the flask you don't want it to be too high up or you're going to get frothing, but you don't want it to be too low. You don't want it actually touching the glass or else the glass could break. I have had experience with both of those and neither of those are fun. Um, so yeah, so then what you're going to do is depending on how, um, how, what type of cells they are. So like insect cells and mammalian cells are going to be easier to break open than bacterial cells, um, but you'll do a variety of cycles of sonication. For insect cells, I'll typically do something like one second on, four seconds off. So for a minute of total time, it'll actually take like five minutes just for planning purposes. Bacteria, because they have cell walls and all that stuff, they're going to be harder to break open. Um, they can take more of a beating. So we typically do something like three times two minutes with two seconds of on and four seconds of off. If you're having trouble, you might do a few cycles and like refreeze it, rethaw it, um, and then do a few more cycles. You really want to avoid having the beaker fall down and then the tip coming too high up and getting a latte. So what you want to do is in between the different cycles, you want to actually make sure the level hasn't dropped. If it has, then adjust the height with like 
it's helpful if you put it on one of those trays that you can then like screw to um, raise or lower the, um, the base. Um, make sure that the ice around it, you have that little bit of water that's going to make it so things are firmly stacked um, and really just try to get this nice cozy home that you're, that the beaker is not going to fall down. When you go and you spin down your cells, if you lysed it well for the bacteria, you should see like a couple of different rings with like different colors. Um, and that indicates that you've, you've lysed things open well. If, you, if your pellet all just like one, looks one color, it might not have been lysed completely. Um, and hopefully that makes sense when you've actually lysed a pellet and you can see there's kind of a darker ring around that main, um, the main pellet, which indicates good lysis. But you don't want to like over lyse things and then be parting your protein in the process too. There are other lysis methods that we can use as well and sometimes we use them in combination because remember sonication it doesn't just break open cells it's also going to help you with that dna shearing whereas other methods um like enzymatic methods to using like breaking up cell walls and things like this those aren't going to mess with the dna so often in those cases you might also add a dna's enzyme if you're not going to do a sonication but sonication can be a really helpful tool when you're trying when you're trying to purify protein out of the cell because you need to break the cell open first um, and try to get that you know DNA away from all that protein which is what you really care about. You can help that DNA precipitate and therefore get pulled out more easily by adding a cationic molecule like PEI polyethylenamine. This is going to take advantage of the hydrophobic effect. So going back to the fact that water had those partial positive and partial negative parts. They like to hang out with other charged or partially charged things and because of the whole opposites attract thing. If you put in something that's not charged at all, it's going to be hydrophobic. The water is not going to want to hang out with it. The water is going to exclude it and that excluded stuff is going to clump together and kind of like precipitate so not be dissolved. If we look at the backbone of DNA, it's negatively charged. And so if we can kind of hide that negative charge with a positive charge, we can make it so that the water won't want to hang out with the DNA. And we can do this by adding a positively charged molecule like PEI. You can make like a 10% solution and then just add it dropwise after you do your sonication. Stick a stir bar into your beaker, stick that on one of the stir plates um, and dropwise add the PEI. Um, I would typically do it to about 0.2%, but you might need to experiment because you can also accidentally precipitate out some proteins. Um, so some people actually use PEI to help purify proteins. Um, so be careful with that. But it is an option if you want to try to help precipitate out some of that nucleic acid before you go and do your spin so that when you spin it down, you're really getting rid of that um, nucleic acid. A final note is that the sonication that we're using, basically these ultrasonic waves are going to be similar to the ultrasonic waves that you see in other applications, such as medical applications or such as whales talking to one another. But in our case, we're using much stronger waves and we're basically sticking them like right in contact with the thing we're working with. And so we're gonna be doing things a lot more intensely. And therefore, that's why this can be damaging to the DNA and to the cell walls and all this stuff. When your doctor is sticking an ultrasound on you, that's going to be a lot safer. Those waves are going to be a lot gentler. And that ultrasound is going to be actually safer than x-rays and things like that, much safer. Um, so don't worry about something like that happening um, during your ultrasound procedure. But we can use some like a, a tamer form of ultrasonication in order to clean jewelry and stuff. And so the same principles apply for that. Um, you're just kind of taking things to a less intense level. So you're not harming your jewelry and things like this. Um, but ultrasonication is really, really helpful in a variety of areas. So hope this helped you understand um, the principles of ultrasonication. You're generating these low and high pressure weight areas through these waves. In the low pressure area, the bubbles are going to form. Those bubbles can't survive, though, because they're going to quickly be hit by a high pressure area, and that's going to cause them to collapse and let out shock waves that are going to um, break apart your sample. But in this case, it's a good thing because what we're breaking apart is those parts that we don't want. Remember that this is going to generate heat, so do it on ice when, you're, when possible. 
and happy purifying.